Yes. Um, is the mic on? Yes. Earth science time. Please write down the title of today's lesson, which is Surface Processes Exam 2. No, I'm just kidding. Don't write that down. Don't write that down. No. Uh, let's call this surface water. Surface water. Which is a surface process. Um, the, other, the other surface processes that we have learned about, which we have also learned about this one, but the other ones that we have learned about are erosion due to gravity, what we called mass movement, um, erosion due to glaciers, and erosion due to wind, which are all sur surface processes. And now we're going to learn about another one, which is called surface water. And we're doing that in the color, you have to the color purple. Why? You did not say first science time. Oops, I actually did. <laughs> you just pay negative one attention. You're anti-paying attention. Oof, I hope this, this does not um, bode poorly for you, even though I know it does. Um, water is both an erosional and a depositional medium. Water is both an erosional and depositional medium. What do I mean by that? Let's break this little sentence, this uh, verifiably true fact down. What does it mean for something to be an erosional medium? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that's carrying sediment. Um, the, the fact that it's an erosional medium doesn't necessarily mean it breaks down. Remember, that's weathering. Weathering is the breakdown of rock into sediment, and erosion is the carrying of that sediment away. But you're right. Um, erosional media are those processes, surface processes. Why are, we, why are we focusing on surface processes? Well, where does erosion occur? Inside of Earth? No. Yeah, it occurs on the surface. And so these, when I say surface processes, I mean, amongst other things, I mean these two things, erosional and depositional processes. And erosional processes are those that remove sediment, and depositional are those processes that... It's the stopping carrying and the stopping moving, the deposition, the depositing. Um, the, this is move. And this is stop. In musical chairs, the erosional process is when the music is playing. And in musical chairs, the depositional process is when the music stops. Erosion is movement of sediment. Deposition is the stopping of that movement. I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. What, what is the quantity that we can measure in about erosional measure about an erosional medium? that determines whether a given sediment is eroded or deposited. What about a, an erosional medium determines whether a particular, ooh, I like this, particular particulate, <laughs> uh, just remember, however much you hate me, I hate myself ten times that much. Determines whether a, a particular... <laughs> it's so stupid. Uh, it is funny, though. A particular sediment... Let's, does, let's, get, let's play Let's Get Real here, folks. What about an erosional medium determines whether a particular sediment is A, eroded, or B, deposited? What is it? This is a very fundamental quantity of the universe. Let's answer this question. Weather. Or what? Eroded or deposited? What is it? What's the one attribute at about an erosional medium? You know this. I know you know this because I've told you this. I know you know this because I sent you four videos that all mention this. What is it? What's the one thing, the one fundamental thing that determines whether a particular sediment doesn't really matter the size at this point, but it, I mean it does depend on the size, but mm, oh, so close, broader than that. Gravity is a source of what for erosion? Yes, exactly right. Energy. Very good, Peyton. Energy. Big energy? What size sediment can it carry? Big sediment. They're directly proportional. Remember proportionality. 
scale proportion and quantity. Directly proportional means that as one increases, the other increases, or as one decreases, the other decreases. And energy and sediment size are directly proportional. Let me put that right here. Energy, I'm going to do it in a different color. This is, this is probably the, the um, second fundamental truth. This was one, that water is both an erosional and depositional medium. The second major truth is this. Energy and sediment size are directly, let's actually spell it right though, directly proportional. The bigger the enemy, didn't mean to say that, the bigger the energy, the bigger the sediment it can carry. This you should have already known, um, but, but there's a corollary to this that we're going to get to, which is if the energy decreases, what happens to the sediment that is currently being carried by that medium? It's, use a verb. Don't, okay, yeah, I like that. That's what I was getting at. I was going to say dropped, but yeah, it's deposit. It's no longer has enough energy to carry it. So as long as the energy is enough to carry something, that thing is being carried. Once the energy slows down or lowers, then now that thing has been deposited. Okay. That's why water is both an erosional and depositional medium. Yes? So would this count as erosional to depositional if, since a lake can still, if, if like a river carried a giant boulder into a lake and then it just plopped? Yeah, that's definitely, that is definitely, definitely it. Definitely it. We're going to, we are, let's, let's talk about that exact case right here. I'm going to do it over here so that it can still be seen. There's this idea in geology, really it's in hydrology or rheology, of stream load. The stream load is the sediment that is moved by a stream. What do I mean by stream? This whole video is just a series of me saying, what do I mean by? What's a stream? Um, a yeah. Could it be a creek? Sure. Could it be uh, what we would normally call a stream? Sure. Could it be a river, waterfall? Sure. All of that, we're going to call it a stream. We're going to group it into the, the stream. Uh, the stream load is sediment moved by the stream. The faster the stream is moving, the larger the sediment that can be moved. Mm -hmm. What makes the stream move faster? Well, let's, let's compare three bodies of water here. Kinetic yeah, it's kinetic energy, but where does that energy come from? Rain. Okay, I like that answer. I, like, I think that's approaching the right answer. It is kinetic energy as it's moving, but how did it get that energy to begin with? It at one time was. This is physical science. Time. This is physical science. Yeah. Yeah, I like that too. We're looking for a specific type of energy though. Potential. Potential. And remember that potential energy depends on height. And so depending on really, really the slope, we end up with. So we have rain falls on these three different areas, okay? Um, precipitation. Remind me of the three things that can happen when precipitation interacts with the ground. This is from a previous, I don't remember if I told you this in real life or if it's from a video. The, that you already watched? <laughs> Not one you've watched? Are you serious? Yeah. I'll tell you. I'll tell you, nope, I don't have room over there because the video won't pick that up. I'll tell you up here. The three things that can happen when precipitation meets the ground are, tell me, you tell me, when, <laughs> shut up, shut up, <laughs> don't, don't do that laughter. <laughs> no. Yes, but that's not, what, that's not specific, uh, actually that's too specific. Um, okay, there we go, there's one. Um, we call that infiltration. What Maud says is that it is absorbed. It infiltrates. That is, the water, we sometimes even use the word percolates, but the water stops being on the surface and starts being underground. It becomes, that is, groundwater. Okay? Infiltration. What's another one? Evaporation. You know what that means. What else? 
runoff. What's the? Um. You told me and Tiana and Mods when we were doing our our lab. That's what you're probably thinking of. It wasn't in the video because you told us about. But you knew it. Well, now I know. Now you know. Yeah. Infiltration. Yeah. So the moral of the story is, even when you think I'm wrong, I'm actually right. And please let that, um, please that ring a bell in your head. Please that ring a bell. Please that ring a bell. Please let that ring a bell. <laughs> okay, so the precipitation falls on these various surfaces. Some of it will infiltrate, depending on what. This is this is going to be in the next unit, but just for now, what is the what does the amount of infiltration depend on? The what of the sediment. Or, uh, porosity, you got it. You almost said it. I'm just going to say that you said it. Por how porous it is. Um, but we're, we're not worrying about that right now. And then it also may evaporate, depending on what? The, the heat and the humidity. But we're not going to worry about that right now, because that, that's really what we're worried about this runoff. So for these three surfaces, how will the runoff differ? This is a lake. Um, fast. Oh my god! Why? Did why? You why fast? Because Steep slope. slope. What? What provides it more energy? Gravity. Yeah, because gravity's greater on a mountain, right? No, come on. Gravity is the same. It's just yeah, the it's the slope is different. The slope is different. Um, and this one, not as fast. Because the slope is lower. And in this one, I tried to make it flat. It'll be the slowest of all. In general, <laughs> in general, in general, how does water flow? I love this question, and I love your dumb little answers. In general, how does water flow? High Say it. Ass. High what to low what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope the mic picked that up, but on the other hand, I really hope it didn't. Okay, I'm going to tell you this, Lily. You're not wrong. What she's she's she is wrong in in the spirit of what she's saying because what she means is what? Give me the word that I'm looking for that I can make fun of you for. How does water flow? Because I'm in, I'm mad. I'm just down. full of rage. Down what? Say it. Say the one word. Downhill. No, it doesn't actually. It doesn't. And you can demonstrate this very easily. Water does not only flow downhill. Water flows, sometimes it does. Water flows from high pressure to low pressure. Secondarily, water also flows downhill. Let me think of, I wish I had, <laughs> this is good. This is the craziest demonstration. Um, <laughs> I have a little bit of tea, which is mostly warm. Let me drink some more. Oh yeah. Uh, you don't know me very well. Good tea. Um, let me get this table over here. And you'll want that. Um, thank you for not wearing your hat in school. So, and I'm trying to do this in a way that the camera will pick up. Ah, yes, it is. Um, I'm going to put this on a little bit of a shoe uh, so that it has some downhill component to it. Bloop. Come on, baby. Look at that. You can, I think you can see that on the video, too. You really can. So, as usual, I have been proven wrong because water is, in fact, flowing. Downhill. It is. You can see it is doing that. Now be careful because I didn't say water never flows downhill. I said that water primarily flows from high pressure to low pressure because now, whoa, did that water flow down? Eventually it did, but first, first it flew up. <laughs> there is still some left. Um, the water did initially flow up. 
the water did initially flow because what? Because water is not special. Water doesn't only flow downhill where everything else does. Water acts depending on the forces acting on it, just like everything else in physics. So that second water flowed uphill, right, counter to gravity, because I had put a greater force on it. Does that make sense? You'll see this. Uh, uh, I was going to, when I was sitting over here like this, I was actually thinking of a way you could do like a thought experiment. But you see water flow uphill all the time. Like you hold a hose outside like this, and the water does flow uphill. So it isn't that it's always flowing downhill. It does usually do this, but it, depending on the other forces acting on it, it may flow really in any direction, um, depending on the forces. I think I know what you're talking about, and, like, and I think what that amounts to is an optical illusion. The question was, isn't there a road that flows up a water? or something like that, right? Or uh, so the water flows up a road. Is that what you're talking about? Like there's a, there's a special road somewhere where you dump your little water like I just did and you're like, oh man, it's flowing uphill, like Cosmos Mystery Area or something. Um, but I think it amounts to an optical illusion. Like what you think is the horizon in that area is actually tilted and it's more like a brain trick than an actual physics trick. Um, but these waters are all flowing, what we would say, downhill. They're flowing downhill. This one's flowing faster because... Not because gravity is stronger in general in this area, but because the slope of this allows for a greater component of the downward gravitational force. And so we get larger, the largest sediments of these, the largest sediments will be carried by what? Which one of these three, A, B, and C, will carry the largest sediments? A. A will carry the largest sediments. Now let's change this diagram a little bit, and we'll smoosh together A, B, and C. Okay? What we might end up with is, in this area, a mountain stream, what size of sediments might be carried by this stream? Make it up. Pebbles. Sure, we'll say pebbles. Pebbles can be carried by this. That's probably true. When it becomes this river, which I tried to draw downhill, kind of failed, and now maybe, maybe the pebbles all get deposited where? Where would, the, where, would we ha where would we expect to find pebbles? Yeah, this is where we'd probably find some pebbles. Why? Well, because the stream is no longer moving fast enough to hold up the pebbles. Um, maybe this stream can carry what? Make it up again. Sediments. Too broad. Sand. Let's say sand. So where would we expect to see sand deposited? In the bottom. At the bottom of the lake. So here we might see some sand. I'm using the standard GLR. I'm trying to use the standard geological symbols for these things. Um, and then in the lake, what kind of sediment might be... Uh, not really carried, but what kind of sediment might be suspended in the lake? Yeah, silt or probably clay, and maybe at the bottom of this we would see some silt. A, a lake deposit is usually silty. It depends, but it, it depends on the bedrock of the area, but probably some silt. But basically, as the, as the stream slows down, sediment is deposited. That's a general trend of erosion. As the stream slows down, it is deposited. Um, streams carry their sediment in, in really three main ways. The stream load is borne up in three main ways. One, saltation. Two, suspension. And three, rolling. I'm, I might include, I should have done this in a different order probably. Oh, it doesn't matter. Those don't have to be in a specific order, but um, the three ways that a stream carries its load are in these three ways. Saltation, suspension, and rolling. Do you know what the root word of saltation is? Salt. Nope. Yeah. Saute. Uh, yeah, ye you're really on a roll today, Peyton. Yeah, what does that sound like to you? Salt. No. Oh, you were so close. Saute, he said. What does that sound like? From, from in the kitchen, yeah, I wish Gabe were here because he would know. When we saute something in the kitchen, what is that? What are you doing? Yeah, you're flipping it. You're throwing it. It means it's from the French for to jump. Um, the, this is that part of the bed load which is continually picked up and then dropped. It jumps. That's to saute. What about suspension? What do you think that is? Yeah, it's, it's suspended in the... In, it's suspended in the bed load, so it kind of stays at one level. 
but it's suspended. It, it's moved along by the stream, but it's suspended in the stream. And then rolling, well, you know what rolling is. It rolls around, around on the bottom. It's kind of like saltation, but it's rolling along the bottom. So saltation is where it's on the ground, carried for a ways on the ground again. On the ground, carried for a ways on the ground again. Suspension is when it's in the medium the whole time, and rolling is when it's pushed only along on the bottom of the stream bed or whatever. And this also applies to Aeolian erosion and to some extent to glacial erosion too. Do you remember what the fancy word for all of this is? Stream erosion? Do you remember what the fancy word is? No? What's the fancy word for all of this? What kind of erosion? Fluvial. Fluvial. No, the A. A something water. Surface. Oh, sorry. <sighs> Let's talk about now a stream as seen from the sky instead of as seen in cross section. Um, this subsection is called stream development. <clears throat> this normally, um, but I lied. We are going to talk a little bit more about cross section first. Uh, What are these little guys up here? Precipitation. Okay, um, this place where usually it's in a mountain, it doesn't have to be, and it's a collection of a large area. Uh, it's not one specific place, but these are usually called the headwaters. Sometimes we will, for cartographic, that is for map purposes, we will identify the headwaters of a particular river, but it's not just one place. It's it's water that's captured from a huge area of land called a watershed. And we'll get to that in the next chapter or the next unit. But these are usually called the headwaters. Um, and as, as the, I should have drawn these in blue too because it's representing water. As the stream goes downhill, I've changed my diagram a little for those of you making the diagram at home. Um, as the stream goes downhill, it continually erodes, and it erodes back towards the headwaters, and we call that headward scissor hands. Headward erosion. Thanks for the courtesy laugh. Headward erosion is as this stream cuts back in the direction of the headwaters. And this is how we end up with things like canyons, specifically the Grand Canyon, is, is uh, headward erosion towards the headwaters of the Colorado River. And it can be really dramatic. That's what I'm looking for. It can be really dramatic like the Grand Canyon. And it depends on the difference in height from the headwaters to this, what we call this little area. You know? Where, I'm, I'm sorry, this, this is the ocean. What do we call this little area? What? Drop off. Nope. What do we call this area where, the, where the, this stream is entering into the ocean or some other still body of water? It may be a delta. We could write that. It isn't always, but it may be a delta. Yeah, that might be a gulf at the end of it. Sure. Um, but it, it's, a, it's somewhere where the water is being itself dropped off, itself deposited. And the area we want to focus on right now is this kind of flat-ish area here, where we end up with this idea of stream, again, development. Most of the erosional energy in these mountain streams, these high slope streams, is done in cutting downward and towards the headwaters. But in the stream, uh, sorry, in stream development, in flatland stream development, it's mostly the erosion is done in a lateral way, in a side to side way. And so we end up with 
maybe we start with this kind of gently curving. We call this curve in a, in a river a meander. And rivers get meanders when they're on a relatively flat landscape. And a really interesting thing happens with meanders because um, a river is not a highway, nor yet a Mario Kart racetrack. And so it's not like the water molecules are individually, individual Mario Kart racers and they see this turn coming up. They don't go like this. That is not how individual water molecules move. Maybe it's how we think of the water moving in general, but in actuality, because of Newton's first law, they're all just moving in a straight line. Right? We're going to say this is downstream over here. Um, but then they get deflected off this way. And so we end up with this area here that is constantly eroded. This is called the cut bank. And we end up with this other area that's kind of like in the shadow of erosion called a point bar. Where's the, where is the water moving the fastest in this little area here? Where's the water moving the fastest of these two? The cut bank. And since it's moving the fastest, that's an erosional environment. And so the cut bank continually gets cut like that. And since it's moving slower in the point bar, it's deposited in that way. And so you can see what happens is this kind of minor meander starts to be more like that. Do you see that? You'll see this even if you ever go on the um, tube ride at Fort Robinson. You'll see all these. Yeah, you'll see you'll see all these places where the stream has cut around. And in fact, if you're riding on that tube ride, you'll notice you yourself. This is you. This is your tube. This is your little body. Um, you'll notice that the stream is carrying you into this. And you have to like, use your oar to shove off, and then you're going this way, and then the stream carries you into that, and you have to shove off of there. And you're not really moving smoothly along the path of the river. You're bouncing from wall to wall. And that's just what the water molecules do. And because of that, the stream develops in a way that the meanders get more curvy. Curvier, you might even say. And a really neat thing happens when, uh, let me erase you out of this diagram and your path. A really neat thing, uh, to me, a really neat thing happens when these get very, very close together. And you can see the more erosion that's occurring here, eventually the water gets a new path. You see that? So now the water will start flowing like this because it's a shorter path. And this basically gets cut off right there, and we're left with this, what's called an oxbow lake. In the areas like the southeastern United States is, is full of, this is one of the main ways the lakes can form, but the southeastern United States is full of oxbow lakes from little meandering rivers, because it's really not very steep, and so it, it undergoes a lot of stream development. These kind of rivers are usually wider and shallower than mountain rivers or upland rivers. They have more tributaries. They have more streams that lead into them, and therefore they have more water, so they're wider. And they're moving slower, and so they erode less deeply, uh, and that makes them shallower. And this is one of the major ways that lakes are made. As a matter of interest, what are some other ways that lakes are made? Give me a couple. <laughs> sure. What? Maybe, yeah, okay. That's, I didn't think of that one, but sure. A, a, a naturally occurring stream, a stream might have... Um, a lake associated with it. You said people. I I don't disagree. Let's think of another one. What's another way that what's another way that lakes are made by nature? Glaciers. Glaciers is the other main one. Um, and then a pretty rare one could be something like a volcanic crater. An even rarer one might be like a meteor crater. But there are other ways too. But this is one of the major ways that a lake is built. Yeah. Oxbow Lake. Oxbow Lake. I wonder if my mic's still on. Yep, it is. Okay, good. I'm really glad that you brought that to this class today. Thank you. Um, one last thing I guess we could talk about that we don't... What... Uh, well, let's make up two more things. Um, what, what generally occurs to sediments? We say the sediments up here are probably, we already talked about this, but the sediments up here are probably what? 
compared to those down here? Larger. Larger. Yep, so larger sediments here. Let me erase that because I also want to point out another thing about it, and this is what I'm getting at. They're larger but also more angular. So they usually, they start out as just like broken chunks, maybe pebble-sized broken chunks, and as they flow down the river, they become smaller because they're breaking more and more rounded. And then by the time we're down here, they're usually pretty round. And by the time down here, they're smaller and really quite round. And in here, it's probably clay. So the, the, there is a rounding process. Why? Well, the longer anything's in an erosional medium, it usually does get rounder because what are they bumping into? It's not, let me be clear another way too. The water is not really what's weathering them. It's the, it's the other fellas, yeah, the other rocks, them bumping into each other. And if you have something that's shaped like this, and it bumps into another thing that's shaped like that, what's going to come off of it, first of all? The corners, right? Then the next time they bunk into each other, the corners come off. And if we keep adding more and more and more corners, eventually we get polygons with more and more and more size. And a polygon with an infinite number of sides is called a... Right, and so eventually it becomes more round. And the nice thing about circle is now what corner is going to break off? It doesn't have any corners left. It just gets rounder and rounder and rounder. When you see the kind of neat little pebbles that people sometimes put as a footpath in their garden, or maybe they just use them, like the playground rocks are pretty round, it's usually rocks derived from this part of a river, where they're moving fast enough to carry pebbles, but they're, they've been in the erosional medium long enough that the pebbles are rounded. You can buy them. It's called river rock, usually. Yeah, yeah. We used to have. They suck. Thanks for letting me know. Oh, what are the two ways? There are two places that this ends. One is a delta, which is the ocean. What's the other? If it, if it instead of going to the ocean, goes onto a flat expanse of land, we call that, let's, let me just redo my diagram a tiny bit. Oop. Lily. Flat expanse of land, we no longer call this a delta, we call it an alluvial fan. And an alluvial fan. It lily is an alluvial fan. Yep. The alluvial fan is just an area where all the sediment from a river becomes deposited, and this usually happens in like a desert. So it'll be a short lived river because of the torrential rains in a desert, carrying a lot of sediment, and they'll spread out at the bottom of a, of a cliff and that will be an alluvial fan. All the sediment that was carried by that short-lived river spreads out at the bottom of the cliff, and that, that forms a fan shape called an alluvial fan. I'm trying to draw this. This is not a very good drawing. Usually poorly sorted. I know you have questions, Lily. I want to hear them. Would you like to see this? Yeah. Questions? Anyone? What is a watershed? A watershed? We, I did say that word once. Uh, a watershed is the whole area of land that any of the runoff or infiltration that occurs there eventually ends up into a certain body of water. So each body of water, whether it's a stream or a lake or the ocean, has its own watershed, which is a whole area of land associated with it that any drop of water that doesn't evaporate there eventually ends up in that body of water. Progressively larger bodies of water have progressively larger uh, watersheds. So like the, the river here, um, I'm thinking of the White River, like the White River Trail that I walk my dog on. There's a certain area of land where any drop of water that falls in that land it, that doesn't evaporate, anything that either runs off or infiltrates, will eventually end up in that river. And that river itself is a tributary of the Niobrara River. So that the watershed of the Niobrara River includes the whole watershed of the White River and also some other rivers that lead into it. And then the, White, the Niobrara River is a tributary of the Missouri River. So the Missouri River watershed is a whole area of land that includes the Niobrara watershed, which includes the White River watershed, and then that one goes into the Mississippi River, which that watershed is half the United States. And that goes into the Atlantic Ocean, and that watershed of the Atlantic Ocean is not only half the United States, but like basically half of North America, South America, Europe, and Africa. 
So a watershed is an area of land associated with a river or a stream or a lake or an ocean. What does separate watersheds? What what do you what might we call a really tallish piece of land between watersheds that separates them? A butte. It could be a, a butte. Plateau. It could be a plateau. Could you walk your dog in the in uh, thank you. In um she's older than that though. It, it is mountain ranges sometimes. In fact, there's one on this continent that separates the Mississippi River watershed from the Colorado River watershed, and it is the Rocky Mountains, and we sometimes call that the continental divide. A divide is what we call a very a tallish piece of land that separates watersheds. And Lily. Am I showing it right now? Nope. 